<laughs> but to start off, I offer you an invitation. If you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, or a magic bean buyer, if you're a pretender, come sit by my fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. And that's our friend Shel Silverstein. But I'm Jordan Greenwald, and I'm fascinated <laughs> with our potential and with what we can become. So tonight I'd like to discuss the power of the flax golden tales that we read, but more importantly, the ones that we spin. And the first thing to realize here in discussing our potential is that it, like anything else that hasn't happened yet, is a work of fiction. So I want to ask each of you, do you have a personal fiction? Is there some thematic thread that describes the character of your actions, ambitions, and beliefs? And if I were to ask you for the thesis that contains the heart of your identity, would you have an answer? These are very important questions for me. Now, I think it's impractical and kind of impossible to know exactly why we're doing what we're doing when we're doing it. And as college students, I think all of us have felt that slight irritation when that relative asks, asks us, so what are you doing after college? And we don't know, and it's like you expect us to know what we're doing with our lives. And at the same time, I think that our identities can be something like essays, in the sense that if we do have a thesis, we're more likely to be aware of that fiction we're hoping to realize, as well as to have a clearer understanding as to how to go about it. Now, if we don't address this inner world of dreams, anxieties, and potentials, we risk meandering, which really means forfeiting who we can become. I think of a Michael Jordan that never discovered a ball in a hoop, and I just think that all the talent in the world would be utterly wasted if we never find the right place to apply it. I call this inner world the microcosmos, because much like the macrocosmos, every individual starts as this single cell that then multiplies and expands indefinitely until at some point consciousness develops, this living creature with an imaginative capacity to create life in places that were once sterile and inert. I am awe-stricken by this capacity of neurons and cells to combine into larger collectives that gain properties no individual component has. I'm sure I'm not the only one who played with Legos. Well, when you finished making your Star Destroyer, did it start flying around and destroying the Rebel Alliance all on its own? Definitely not, unless you had like the one-way trip from one side of the room to the other and then it breaks and your mom gets mad at you. <laughs> so I'm equally awe-stricken by the magnitude of the responsibility that such a staggering feat of biology leaves on our shoulders. Because we can become anything, but at the same time, we can become anything. So perhaps you, like I, have experienced this intimidation as we confront the enormity of our potential. So how are we to know what to do with any of this? How do we learn what we want to do with our consciousness? Well, I think looking at kids is a great place to learn because they often seem very convinced about what they're going to be. They're going to be the next president, the next NBA star, or the next princess, or the next Luke Skywalker. Well, how do they learn this? I argue that it's by a fairly simple process of conditioning. That somewhere in their lives, they are exposed to the roles that these characters play, either on TV, in movies, in books, or in the stories that we tell them. And something in them hears about these roles and says, I want that. This emotional connection is intuitive from a very young age. I, for one, spent most of preschool dressed as Aladdin because I identified with him. He made mischief and thievery cool as he steals bread for him and Abu in the marketplace of Agrabah, making all of the guards look like bumbling fools. But he was also noble because once he and Abu get back and are about to be able to share that bread, they find those pair of children who are more needy than they are and ultimately, Aladdin's tale is one about self-acceptance, as he realizes that he, as that street rat, is worthy of the princess's love, just as much as it is about the triumphant justice, as Jafar is expelled into the lamps. And as we feel throughout this, and we get chagrined as he embarrasses himself and tries to be this brave and macho prince for Princess Jasmine, we get initiated into this emotional experience of values. Give me a second for my cheat sheet. I give myself three lifelines, this is one of them. OK. 
Okay, got past that part. Uh huh. Ah! Many people like to refer to these values, such as justice or fairness, as intellectual constructions that have no concrete basis outside of their abstract concepts. I do not think these people could be more wrong. Our very own preeminent primatologist, Dr. Franz de Waal, has exactly that experiment on fairness. And just this idea that you can provoke this violent agitation by doing what we could really only understand as a violation of fairness, we see that these senses of value are not merely intellectual constructions. I don't think that these monkeys articulate to themselves in some sort of philosophical tract what fairness is. Rather, they feel it. And that, to me, is pretty amazing. This brings me of the importance of, to the importance of exposure to narratives. In stories, both fictional and non-fictional, if we read them or watch them actively, we get to engage with the characters. And if we understand them, we can anticipate them and feel for them, or even feel as them. And these stories help to give us an emotional education that serves to clarify what values are important to us. And this emotional exposure is crucial to us and to our identity, because our emotions are something like appliances. And if we never plug them into the right outlet, we may never know what they do or what they feel like. And if we don't know that, we may never even be able to imagine the life dream that fulfills those deepest parts of our identities. Now, this is not to diminish the very real experience and support that we get from our family and our friends and our communities. I don't think that any life of pure spectating just reading books or just watching movies could ever be meaningful in a substantial way. The challenge and the beauty of this emotional education is to learn to implement it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, Aladdin is not the only planetary character in my microcosmos. And to showcase the impact of these people who some may say do not exist off the page, I want to reference two men who have changed my life. And my first introduction to one of these men of immeasurable influence was the face without guilt or pain or fear. Truly, this is a hero, a man who would brave any obstacle, a man who has met no equal, a man who would not buckle as he sought to disintegrate the cornerstones of the corrupt society all around him. From this man, I lived with the words seething in my head, in the name of the best within you, do not sacrifice this world to those who are its worst. In the name of the values that keep you alive, do not let your vision of man be distorted by the ugly, the cowardly, the mindless, and those who have never achieved his title. Do not lose your knowledge that man's proper estate is an upright posture and an intransigent mind that travels unlimited roads. Do not let your fire go out, spark by irreplaceable spark, in the hopeless swamps of the approximate, the not quite, the not yet, the not at all. Do not let the hero in your soul perish and the lonely frustration for the life you deserved but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battles. The world you desire can be won. It exists. It is real. It's possible. It's yours. Staggering, right? But kind of uplifting, too. I kind of feel floored to the ceiling. But there's another part that I often omit because it contains the bulk of the challenge, but without which the message is purely fantasy. But to win it, he cautions, requires your total dedication and a total break from the world of your past. This man is called John Galt. And for a while, I was so swept away by his passionate but still detached sense of justice that I recall wanting to live like him. I wanted to earn, in addition to the respect of those whom I respected, the disrespect of those whom I did not. And I savored the idea that other people saw me as condescending or arrogant because I liked that repudiation of minds that I thought were too small to appreciate what a battle interpersonal honesty is. But then I met another man in another world. And in many respects, this man was just as great as John Galt. He was unwavering in his commitments, relentless in his ambitions, and penetrating as laser beams in his insight. But it's funny how the extent of the similarities only magnify the importance of that one crucial difference. Because for all his greatness and his passion and his integrity and his conviction, 
he was kind. And most important of all, he was vulnerable. His face carried more fear and pain and guilt than any I've seen or imagined, and it is so easy to picture his six-foot-four frame convulsing as he weeps to his wife, my boy is gone. And how much more revolutionary the spirit for persevering with all these emotions rather than being impervious to them. What courage, which Mark Twain describes as resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. And from this man, who endured so much malice and received so little charity, I carry the words, with malice toward none, and with charity for all, and with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish that work which we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds and to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all we may to achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace within ourselves and among all nations. And from this man, I learned by feeling more powerfully than any syllogism could persuade that I value compassion over justice where they happen to collide. Now I know better than any that I can be remiss and aloof and petty and judgmental and vindictive, but at least I have this emotional education to hold true. And I am forever indebted to Abraham Lincoln and to Doris Kearns Goodwin for her tender illustration of him. You may disagree with my evaluation, but you cannot disagree that your exposure to these two men has helped you on to this refined understanding of your own values. In writing on acting, the French philosopher Denis Diderot discusses the model ideal, the ideal model, which is kind of like this frame by frame blueprint for what the actor should be doing at any given time, down to their intonation and their gestures and their twinkles in the eye. And so in that sense, it's this mental representation of the actor's potential. And the idea is that by having an awareness that mediates between what the actor is doing and what this ideal model says they should be doing, they can slowly approximate it and bring it to life. And when I learned of this idea, I thought, is our concept of self any different? In stories, we have the opportunity to select this sort of elite and idealized pantheon of characters that we can tack on to the night sky of our microcosmos as pole stars, illuminating what we might be and what we should never be. This to me is the threshold where fiction meets reality, the abstract meets the concrete, and aspiration is given flesh in the form of action. Some of the functions of great literature that I've noticed is that it helps us to understand who we were, exposes us to who we are, and whispers to us who we might become. It edifies the teacher in us, clarifies the mirrors of self-reflection, and stokes the forges of imagination. And from my exposure to literature, I've learned that my thematic thread that describes the character of my actions, ambitions, and beliefs is that of the prudent hedonist. Hedonist in the sense that, yes, I live for my happiness, but prudence in the knowledge that happiness does not come from a single night, and that when it does come, it will not truly be mine, because it will be inseparable from the happiness of those I love. So as my time comes to a close, I offer you a very simple message. Read. Read for yourselves. Read for your children if you've got them. Watch movies if you prefer, or watch TV, but watch it actively. Engage with the characters and feel for them, maybe even feel as them. And have courage in the reality of these fictions and realize that we too are driven every day by those fictions that we consider compelling enough to earn our devotion and daily attention. The fiction of earning a degree and being a college graduate, of being a professor or an artist or a successful business owner or a respected researcher. And then perhaps one day, if we follow these fictions long enough and hard enough, we will arrive at that place where, like Aladdin, our Jafars are bottled up, our princess accepts us for who we really are, and we may bask in full awareness of the invention that we have made of ourselves, by ourselves, and for ourselves. Thank you.